Hello everybody and welcome to our very last video on chapter 2 of your computer systems text. We'll finish up section 4 of chapter 2 by mentioning some things about floating points in C, a small summary of what we need to keep in mind about working with floating points, and then we'll talk about a few extras. Specifically, we'll look at what the steps of encoding a floating point number, normalization, rounding, and post-normalization look like in practice. The rounding and post-normalization are what we were talking about when we looked at fixing a floating point after addition and multiplication in the last video. So, C gives us two levels of precision. The float type is single precision, and the double gives us a double precision floating point representation. Also, keep in mind that casting between int, float, and double types changes the bit representation. Going from a double or float to an int truncates the fractional part. Remember that ints represent whole numbers only. It's effectively like rounding towards zero. When we have a float or double values that are out of range or not a number, thus undefined, C will generally set the value of the int to the minimum possible two's complement number. Going from an int to a double will give an exact conversion as long as the word size is less than or equal to 53, which is the number of bits in the frac field of a double precision float. Going from an int to a float will just round according to the rounding mode because we need to fit the frac portion of the resulting float into the 23 bits available for the frac field in a single precision float. So, some things to keep in mind about floating point numbers. IEEE floating point has clear mathematical properties and represents numbers of the form m times 2 to the e. Because of this, we can reason about operations independent of the implementation. Also, like everything else we've talked about, it's not the same as real arithmetic. Because of issues with rounding and overflow, floating point arithmetic violates associativity and, distribu and distributivity. This can make things tough for compilers and anyone trying to implement numerical applications. This slide shows some interesting numbers and their bit representations as floats. I'd recommend pausing the video and taking a look at these, making sure you understand what these numbers are, what they represent. So let's take some examples all the way through the floating point encoding process. We'll use the 8-bit tiny float format that we talked about in the last videos. First, we normalize to have a leading one, then round to fit within the frac field, and post-normalize to fix the effects of rounding if it's necessary. These numbers are the examples we'll use. Here we just see the numbers in decimal and unsigned integer binary formats. Here we see what normalizing the numbers looks like. Notice that we just set the binary point so that each one has a leading one, and adjust the value of the exponent based on how many places we move the binary point. For this example, we assume that the binary point starts on the left of the binary representation, and then we shift the unsigned integer bit vector to the left however many times we need to in order to have a leading one. The exponent would start at 8 because we have an 8-bit representation here, and decrements for every bit we shift left. So, since the shift the bit vector for 128 once, the exponent ends up being 7. We shift the bit vector for 15 5 times, so the exponent ends up being 3, etc. For rounding, we take a look at a simple way to evaluate which way to round. We divide our fractional representation into groups of bits and focus on 3 bits. The guard bit is the least significant bit of the result. That's one that we're going to keep. The round bit is the first bit that gets removed through rounding, and the sticky bit is the OR of the remaining bits. Basically, the sticky bit indicates whether the remaining bits are all zeros or not. It's zero if all remaining bits are zero, and one otherwise. So, we can use the following rules to determine whether to increment or not. If the round and sticky bits are both one, we know that we are more than halfway, and we increment the result. This goes back to our discussion of rounding in a previous video. If the bits starting with the round bit are of the form 1 followed by zeros, we are exactly halfway. The sticky bit being 1 indicates that we have a 1 somewhere after the round bit, so we know that we're over halfway, and so we increment. If the guard and round bits are both 1 and the sticky bit is 0, we are halfway, and we need to increment to get a 0 in the least significant bit of the result, which is required by the round to even rule. In any other case, we don't need to increment in order to round to even properly. Let's take a look at a few of the examples below. 
In the case of 128, the round bit is zero, so we know that we are less than halfway to the next value, so we don't increment. In the case of 17, the round bit is one and the sticky bit is zero, which means that we are exactly halfway between the possible rounded values, but the guard bit is zero, which means the result is already even, so again, we don't need to increment the result. For 19, the round bit is one and the sticky bit is zero, just like with 17, but the guard bit is one in this case, so we need to increment for the round to be even. Finally, in the case of 63, the round bit is one and the sticky bit is one, indicating that we are more than halfway to the next value, so we will increment the result. Notice that in the case of 63, we end up with m being equal to two, so we're going to have to post-normalize. So in the case of 63, our rounding has caused an overflow, and we need to fix that. We can handle it by shifting right once and incrementing the exponent as shown here. And that covers the end of chapter two. Thanks so much for sticking with me, and we will see you in our next set of videos on chapter six, covering the memory hierarchy and cache memories.